So I will kick us off, uh, if that's okay. It's uh, absolutely uh, my distinct pleasure to uh, welcome today uh, Joanna Price, who's the uh, an SVP at the Coca-Cola Company, uh, where she is the Chief of Public Affairs, Communications and Sustainability. Um, she's been with Coke uh, for, for many years, uh, started out in, uh, in Australia and, uh, you know, worked around the world for Coke. Uh, and I'm sure we'll share some of those stories along the way. Um, I am Michael Diamond. I'm the Academic Director of the Integrated Marketing and Communications Department here at NYU School of Professional Studies. Um, and I'm a professor in the Department of, uh, of the Division of Programs in Business. Um, and as is always uh, true, it, it is an enormous pleasure for me to see students gathering together with uh, practitioners, uh, certainly of uh, you know, the caliber and esteem of, of, of Joanna, but also curated so beautifully by their faculty, in this case, George Benaroya. And um, you know, George, I think, is one of the most uh, principled student-centered faculty we have and, and really has has made this uh, foundational course, Finance for Marketing Decisions, uh, something even bigger, you know, and now uh, launched this uh, leading global growth series uh, through a series of really wonderful conversations, um, essentially animated by our students. So it's a, it's, a good, it's a good thing all around and very much at the heart of the way we think about uh, an applied professional education. So without further ado, I, I'm gonna turn it over to George. If any of our, um, panelists, oh sorry, our attendees have questions. You'll find that you can't chat them in, but you can put them in the Q&A. So if you do have questions along the way, uh, we'll try and find some time to take some questions from the attendees as well as those from the students, but just pop them in the Q&A and I'll, I'll moderate that when they come through. All right, many thanks. Over to you, George. Great, thanks very much, Michael. For those of you who have just joined, my name is uh, George Benaroya. I started my career at Procter & Gamble, then uh, I work at Tetra Pak, Nivea, and now I work in private equity as a CFO. Now, once per week, I get to do something I love, and that is to teach this finance class. What I do is I do it in person during the day. And then for those who work or are joining from Asia, we do it online. So what you have joined now is the online um, session. And um, this is not teach, right? So we're not actors. This is a real class uh, going on now live. And the way we do it is on the first session, students, the ones that you will see and, and the ones that you don't see, pick a company, any company they want and they pick Coca-Cola. And then every week we learn about finance by having the students make one business decision. So the first one is about people or headcount. And this is how Remy did it. The idea is how will you persuade your boss at Coca-Cola to let you hire more marketing people? And that was rational and, and so on. I started doing this about three years ago, and I was telling students that uh, sometimes you have a lot of demand for a product and you don't have enough of it, right? And so you have to choose whether to give it to your old clients or to new clients. And the idea is whom will you prioritize? And this is what Roxanne did um, if she was working at Coca-Cola. Now, what is really interesting is that before the pandemic, students will typically say, well, let's get the new customers so that we can you know, make more money. But at the peak of the pandemic, no one did. The other thing that we do is this idea of learn by doing, right? So um, to learn about a blockchain, 26 students went ahead and make one blockchain themselves. And then now NFTs is getting more and more popular. So what we did about it, was to learn all the questions that we, we, we had to, um, so to speak, learn what is behind, right? Like, what is an NFT? How much does it cost to make an NFT? How do you make an NFT? And uh, should we use Coinbase or Avalanche or Ethereum and so on? So we did all that. We spent about five weeks doing it. And then uh, I'll come back um, to that at the end. But the other thing that we 
try to do is all the things that we learn to um, make them available to others. So we put that on, on um, our class side, which is public. And um, anyone who owns a small business or anyone who wants to get an NFT, there are three simple steps for them to get one of those. Now, when we go back to this idea of a global company, at a global company, we do have the resources and the talent. So what Tony did is, okay, at Coca-Cola, how can we use NFTs to grow our sales? And this is the recommendation that he made with the team. Two or three years ago, I will have to explain to students from the US and Europe what inflation is. Now it's easier. But when you have inflation, what do you do about it? So we learned how to quantify and actually make a price increase, the impact and so on. This is how Claudia did it. And then she showed how she would do it in the different regions and then there will be different percentages and the overall impact. But then the trick is, okay, you make it, right? But then how would you, how would you explain the price increase to your clients? And this is how Niharika did. And when I look all these things that they prepare, they look so real that sometimes I'm tempted to go and call the numbers that they list there. Now, she is not one of my students, the one on the left-hand side. But what do you do when clients react like that and they reject your price increase. So this is how Kiana would have managed that. And then the final part is to invite these executives who actually are making all these decisions during their daytime, so to speak, to come to us and share with us how they make them. So as Michael said, today we ask, we have Joan Price, the Chief of Communications, Sustainability and Public Affairs for the Coca-Cola company, North America. Now, I like to make the presentations a bit more at the personal level. And what is terrific about um, Joan Price is that she has worked both at headquarters, the, the words that we use for that in companies is global or the region and, and so on, and also at the country level. She lived in Shanghai and Sydney and Hong Kong and many other cities. So she will be able to tell us how you reason through things both at the global level and then when you're running things. She has also um, managed operations in North America and South America and Europe and Asia and Africa. So that's why it's so terrific, right? Because we were going to be able to learn and to leverage her experience. So on behalf of all of us, thank you so much and welcome. Thank you. So the students will be asking the questions themselves one by one. And maybe we can start with Feng, if you're ready. Hi, Ms. Price. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Feng and my question is, Coca-Cola has built a reputation for soft drinks. So how is the company coping with the changing consumer trend toward less sugary beverages? And how could Coca-Cola tap into the healthy beverage market while not alienating its established brand for soft drinks? Great. Thank you, Feng. And thank you, George and Michael, for the honor to talk to all of your students tonight. So, Feng, that's a great question. And I think you opened it sort of talking about Coca-Cola is a soft drink company. We actually like to consider ourselves a total beverage company. And by that, I mean, we offer a wide variety of beverages for all occasions and all times of the day. So for example, we're really well known for Coke, kind of Sprite, maybe Fanta, but we also have Minute Maid and Simply, which is a juice brand for those times of the day where you'd want juice or juice drinks. We also have Fairlife Milk. We've got water brands such as Dasani, Smart Water, Aha, Topa Chica. There's a lot of different water brands we have all around the world. Um, we also have Gold Peak Tea, Costa Coffee, and then obviously the different array of what we call sparkling beverages. Importantly, in regular, low calorie and no calorie options. And then we also have sports hydration drinks, Powerade and our recent full acquisition of Body Armor. So we've focused a lot in the last couple of years on really not only expanding that portfolio, but expanding the choices. So less sugar, mid-range sugar, no sugar, 
and then also a huge variety of packaging sizes to account for all the different tastes. So thank you so much. Um, should we go into the next question? And I think I'm going to ask the question on behalf of Jia Chen. And his question is, has COVID-19 caused a change in consumers' beverage consumption habits? And does Coca-Cola have a strategy to deal with that change in consumption? George, I think that's a very topical question. I suspect that when all of us sort of started to head home, in various stages in Q1 of 2020, and I think everyone has a little bit of, was that 2019, was that 2020, was that 2021? Um, I don't think anybody expected it to be the, tra the transformation that it's been. Um, so yes, the short version of that is consumer behavior has changed substantially in the last two years. Think about the fact of what we're even doing from a classroom point of view and how we're doing meetings at work and things like that. And I think we're going to continue to see it evolve. I think that this is just the beginning. You know, and as I look back and think about as we were going down into the lockdowns, like in the US in March 2020, like we saw a lot of anxious shoppers. We saw empty shelves. We saw people stocking up. You know, you think it, like it's only two years ago and it feels like a lifetime ago, but just that mass buying and like we couldn't get toilet paper you know just the little things that you started to take for granted um and for us at that point and it happened around the world governments deemed our business as essential they basically went through and said all food and beverage companies are deemed essential services and so we ended up in an interesting situation where we had part of our workforce like in like having to be on the front lines, in factories, in the supermarkets, like stocking shelves, delivering product, manufacturing products. And then we had a whole group of other people who were locked at home. So just, and so just kind of managing that was, like that was hard on the business. Um, but it obviously, this wasn't, as we all know, this was a global pandemic. I think one of the advantages we had of Coca-Cola was as we watched the pandemic roll around the world in different countries. You know, for example, we were on the phone in February talking to our China counterparts about what were the steps they were taking? What were they doing? Europe came next. What were they doing? What? And so trying to get ahead of this as fast as we could to think through, well, what do we need to do for our frontline staff? How do we keep them safe? What does this look like? What are the systems we need to put in place to keep like the office workers connected and online and the business moving? Um, so we... The other thing, too, that we also had to go through from a, a business point of view was prioritisation. And, George, I think you kind of, we were talking about this earlier, like supply chains got impacted. We couldn't get certain either raw materials, packaging, aluminum was under pressure. Like there was a lot that we were having to, to work through and prioritise and think, what do we need to get out first? What comes second? What do we stop producing? And they were some of the decisions that we had to make. Um, I think in summary, when we sort of look back on those sort of two years and what we went through, you know, there's a couple of like buzzwords that often come to mind, but I actually think it really applied. People had to suddenly be a lot more agile. They had to adapt. They had to be laser focused on what did the consumer actually need. But also for us, we had to be laser focused on how do we protect the safety and the well-being of our associates. Um, and all of this required a new approach. It required new thinking. And if I'm really honest, it either worked or it didn't. And we learned and we tried something different. Um, so if you then sort of fast forward to where we are now and we're seeing a resurgence of COVID, we're watching what's happening in Shanghai and China. We're seeing the numbers start to go back up. COVID is still very much a part of the conversation. We then overlay what's happening in terms of Russia and Ukraine and the impact on supply chains and things like that that's happening there. I just think that there's a component that this is the new, this is the new world order, if that makes sense. This is the new way. And businesses can't rely on old practices, old systems, old behaviors. You've got to get very laser focused on the consumer. What is it they need? Where are they going? How are they thinking about it? But importantly, how do you continue? to ensure your 
your employees are safe and healthy. Mm. So that was a lot, George. <laughs> it was all very, very useful. So thanks so much. And the next question is from Marina. Hi, Ms. Preston. My name is Marina. First of all, thank you so much for, for meeting with us today. It's a great pleasure to learn your vision uh, about our question. So my question is, how do you generate such, such a great idea uh, like uh, uh, Essa Coca-Cola Efanta in Brazil or annual, or your uh, annual yeah. Christmas advertising with Santa? Uh, Marina, thank you. That's a really good question. Um, look, and you know, as the Coca-Cola company and someone who works for the Coca-Cola company, I think that marketing is probably one of the things that we do best as a corporation. And our marketers have the privilege of being able to work and market some of the best brands in the world. Now, clearly, I have a biased opinion, because, but I honestly feel like that. And Marina, actually, one of the things that we've been doing is actually looking at a new marketing model in terms of how do we get more efficient and more effective globally. We start to talk a lot about networked organisation. And traditionally, we've tended to do everything country by country, but we've got to get a lot smarter about how do we be more effective and more efficient. And we really are fundamentally transforming the way we execute our marketing programs. And the idea being, good ideas can come from anywhere. They're not the bastion of just the person who's working on brand coke in X country, for example. And so what we're trying to do is make sure that our teams are set up and connected, that they can leverage the size and the scale of the company to generate great ideas. And the idea being, for example, we, we can have marketing campaigns that come out of our Latin American team or our European team. And to be honest, the role of, and we realize it's effective, it's doing what it needs to do. It'll come to our North American team and their role is really just to localize it. But then there are gonna be other initiatives that our North American team takes the lead on. They identify the consumer need, they test it here, they develop it, and then other countries just pick it up and implement it. Historically, we've tended to have a habit of that doesn't work here or that doesn't apply here. That's not true anymore. And we've just got to be faster and more efficient. I think one of the nicest things about the Coke company is like we have really smart, creative people in the organization. And I think one of the most important things is to just remember that good ideas can come from anywhere. And you really, nobody has a mortgage on not invented here. Thank you very much, uh, Joan. Our next question is coming from Rusty. Good evening, Ms. Price. It's a pleasure to have you join us here tonight. I'm Rishti Thakur. My question for you today is, Coca-Cola has always had a great product placement in movies and TV shows. I was wondering what's the process of deciding in which movie or TV show and what scene would you place Coca-Cola or your next product? Rishti, that's a great question. Um, I have two children and they'll often like, love to point out to me, oh, there's the Coke, how did that happen kind of thing. So as you would appreciate, um, the process, believe it or not, the process is actually quite simple. Um, we, we receive a lot of requests, as you could imagine, from TV shows, movies, and even celebrities that want to use our products in their social channels, for example. Um, and to be honest, we see this as a good thing. The fact that writers, influencers, directors want our products in their shows. I think it's a, it's a testament to the cultural relevance of our, our products. Um, we have a very deliberate vetting process because we want to make sure that we're protecting our brands, that we're making sure that we're being positioned in the most favourable light for our products. So believe it or not, we actually use one agency in LA that actually we, anything that comes direct into the company, we send straight to them. But for most of the people who are in the industry, they know that this agency does the work for them. So they'll often go direct to them. Um, and then we obviously also work with the agency because sometimes we might identify opportunities where we think, 
but so it's a bit of a two-way relationship. Requests come in, but we also see opportunities that we will go and work with or identify in certain TV or film or other content opportunities. So I know this sounds, it sounds really simplistic and it's amazing how much it is, but you probably appreciate how many requests come in that we needed a really strong, robust process that allows us to have a firm grasp of where and whenever our products show up in movies or TV shows. Tony, um, would you like to go next? Yeah. Um, hi, Ms. Price. Uh, my name is Tony. And thank you so much for joining us and giving us the opportunity to ask your question. So, uh, Uh, we might have lost Tony. I'm sorry. Already. Yeah, I'm I sorry. My, okay. my video okay. yeah. shut off for some reasons as I, when I speak. Uh, no worries, so, Tony. Yeah, so my question is uh, Coca Cola launched um, Coca Cola with Coffee Matcha mm -hmm. in this February, right. which I absolutely enjoy myself. And apparently, Coca Cola also has lots of like other derivative products. So I'm just wondering uh, what kind of process does Coca-Cola use when it comes to launching your product? Yes, no, and Tony, I'm a huge fan of Coke with coffee too, I have to say, it's kind of my 11 a.m. pickup. Um, we are, and I think I mentioned this earlier in response to another question, we are very focused on following the consumer and understanding the consumer behavior, the journey that consumers are on, and we are also seeing a significant blend of categories. Um, so coffee isn't just coffee anymore and, and Coke and sparkling isn't just on its own. So as you would probably all appreciate, we do a lot of consumer research and studying consumer behavior before we even think or consider bringing new products to the marketplace. And in fact, Coke with Coffee is a great example of a product that was actually brought to market in several countries outside of the US before it even hit the shelves in the US. And in fact, we actually only recently, in terms of like March, launched it into Canada. But obviously, every time we do these things, we're making sure that we're testing and we're learning. And when we find something that's successful, wherever it is in the world, how do we scale that with speed? Um, so... As I sort of said, the team, the marketing team, the innovation teams are really open to experimenting. We're really trying to encourage what we term internally as a test and learn approach. And look, the reality is not every process to launch a product is going to work. And not every product, even if it makes it to launch, is going to be successful. But for us, one of the things that we really try to instill in the culture is the idea of never dismiss what you learn as you're going through these things. We really try to instill a philosophy of the idea of be, be the best at getting better. So how are you continually learning as you're going through? So Tony, to your question, there's not really one specific process that we follow to launch new products. But as I said, we really we sort of anchor it into understanding the consumer, the consumer behavior, understanding things that they're doing, where are the opportunity for blending of, ca of categories? I think the thing that we all have to sort of realise is that change is constant and the consumer is really dynamic. And the more we can do to understand their different behaviours and the things that they're doing, the more opportunities it identifies for us for new products. Thanks Thank for, uh, very much for that, uh, John. Um, Tony, I'm sorry that you had trouble with uh, your video, but look, we have a photo of you in the beginning, right, with NFTs, and we have another photo of you coming back, so so don't worry. Um, I only get to ask one question, so um, I thought about which one I had many, but um, I'm asking this question on behalf of one half of the world population, and it goes like this. For those of us who are introverts or English is not our first language, any tips? And then coming from a colleague of mine who is a senior vice president at a Fortune um, 500 company, and he says, do I have any chance to make it to the C-suite if I am an introvert? Mm -hmm. George, it's a great 
question. And I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to share something from a personal point of view. I like I'm an introvert. I and it's been an interesting journey for me. And there was one I mentioned earlier that I have two children. I have a son and a daughter. And I think my son was probably at, towards the end of elementary, beginning of middle school, so around about nine in the US. And I think they must have done like a Myers-Briggs or some equivalent type study like that. And he's come home and he was really blue and sort of sort of down in the dumps a bit. And when I questioned what had happened that day, he was like, oh, I'm an introvert. And he felt like that that was quite a negative label that had been put against him. Now, keep in mind, I'm talking to my nine-year-old son. So I actually started to talk to him because I'd felt it as well on the way through where people like label you, label you as an introvert. And I sort of talked to him about, I don't really like the labels because of what people then naturally infer, but I would rather people think about it as a concept of where do you source your energy from? And so I talked to him about a chip bowl, nine-year-old chip bowl. Um, and I said, so for example, his father and his younger sister are extroverts. Now, that means that they source their energy from interacting with people. So when they've been on their own or they've been asleep all night, they start with their chip bowl empty. And every time they interact with somebody, their chip bowl gets filled. I said to my son, you and I, if we've been on our own and we've had a good night's sleep, we start our chip bowl in the morning with it being full. And every time we interact with someone, they're taking chips out of the chip bowl. And what I sort of said to him was, that doesn't mean that I can't go and do all the things that an extrovert would kind of go and do. Like I have to in this job, I have to do classes like this. I have to go to dinners. I have to go and talk to people. But what I also know is that I then need the downtime. I need the time on my own to recharge so I can go and do it again. So I really tried to explain to him, it's not a case of it doesn't mean, because you're an introvert, it doesn't mean you can can't go and talk to people because you're shy. You can, but just be aware that it takes a lot out of you. So that was, so that was a way that I kind of like, like that's how I like to think about it. Um, and so to me, to then to your question about can you get into the C-suite, like I like to think that everybody has the capacity to be a leader. I don't think it matters whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. It's a, to be honest, I think it's about the environment you create for your teams. Do they grow? Do they grow? Do they learn? Is it a trusting environment? Are you challenging them? Are they thriving? Are you helping them with their careers? At the end of the day, I am a firm believer that the stronger and the better the people are underneath you, you get elevated as well. And if you want to keep moving up the, the career chain to the C-suite, if you've got great people underneath you, all boats lift and you will continue kind of the ride up. And I think part of like, even before you get into leadership positions, that network, like get guidance from other people who are managers, learn from their mistakes, get trusted mentors who can kind of push you and challenge you in a really safe way, hold the mirror up to you about the good, the bad, the ugly of what they see in you. And so, and even from a Coke point of view, for example, like they, our values, our leadership values are things like be a role model. Seek the right outcome, not the comfortable one. Dream big, establish a compelling vision. Make your passion irresistible. And like, to me, those sorts of values, it doesn't matter whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, you can do them both. You can do it all. Well, super. Thanks very much on behalf of one half of the world population, right? So, um, okay, Erica, would you like to go next? Erica yes. is not an introvert. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, good evening, uh, Ms. Price. Thank you so much for taking the time of your busy schedule to meet with us. I think this is a great opportunity for us and Coca-Cola is such a wonderful company, you know, not only to enjoy as a consumer, but also to research as a marketer. Um, so my question is more on the personal side. If you can share, um, what's the most significant change you've ever went through in your career and how did you handle the change and any tips that you can share? Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Erica. Um, hmm. So 
you know, it's interesting when I think about this question, Erica, because I think that, like, I have had so much change. I think Michael talked before, or George, like, all the different roles that I've had, the different countries I've worked in, and I do think change is a constant. And if I'm honest, I love change. I love the challenge it brings, the learning that it encourages. So I love kind of constant change. But as I think about your question, Eric, Erica, I kind of, there's a bit where I was, I was thinking about maybe taking it as a time, because often when people talk about change, it's a time when you were most challenged or you were most uncomfortable. So if I reflect on that on a personal point of view, I think there was a time where I, I was in a situation, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment, where I really felt what I stood for and what I believed and what I represented was being challenged and was going to be undermined. Um, so I was in a situation where, and I'm in the type of role where I, I like I'm the front face, the front line for all crises, everything that goes wrong, it's like over to you and can you just make it go away. Um, and we, I'd come off a series of different issues that I'd been fixing and managing, including a really significant one where we had made, achieved, or we had been given a major fine by a regulatory authority. And I'd sort of, this was a year ago, I'd used a year to rebuild relationships and connections and credibility of the company with what was going on. And the company was looking to launch a new product. And as part of that process, I'd been asked to go and see how the regulators felt about it and what was likely to be the outcome. And because I'd spent a year rebuilding all those relationships, they gave me really honest feedback about how they felt about the impact of this product. And I went back to my senior leader, my boss at that point, the head of the business and said to him, so if we launch this product, this is what's gonna happen. And we had threats that they would potentially change the, the legislation around us. There was a lot that was going on. He was like, okay, he thought about it. He came back to me that afternoon and said, we've made the decision that we're still gonna go ahead and launch this product. I went home that night to talk to my husband and I was really, I was really riled up about it all. And I was struggling to articulate why I was feeling so churned and angry and upset about all of this. And in the conversation with my husband, there was a couple of key observations that I learned, which was, I actually felt that should they do this, this was a problem that was beyond me being able to fix. Um, so I couldn't fix it. Um, I felt that my credibility with the relationships that I'd built was going to be called into question because those people had given me really honest feedback and then I basically turned my nose up at them and we launched the product anyway. So series of conversations with my husband that night. I went back in the next morning and went up to my boss at that point and basically said to him, I've thought a lot about this overnight and I know this is ultimately the business's decision, but here's a few key things. I know you think I can fix all these things because I've done X, Y, and Z for the last year. I can't fix this one. I feel like my personal credibility is now under threat. And I rattled through a few different things. And so for me, I think, Erica, one of the key learnings that I took from it all was, and keep in mind, I've now been with the company 19 years, and this was earlier in my career. A, a job is a job. You know, it's like you, everyone's really good at what you do and you can always go and get another job somewhere else. But you have to make sure that what you are doing fits with you internally and that you can look at yourself in the mirror and don't ever be afraid to have the hard conversations. We didn't launch that product. Very much, um, Joanne. So the next question is from Marielle. Marielle. Andra, sorry. Hi, Miss Price. How are you? Thank you for joining us today. It's an honor to be able to learn from you. I'm Mariale. I'm from Lima, Peru. And actually, like Coke has been a huge part in my life. It's my dad's favorite drink. And personally, I don't drink coffee. So during my undergrad, a bottle of Coke was always right next to me to help me like uh, keep awake in long nights. So yeah. it's an honor to be able to ask you a question. So and my question is sustainability has evolved, right? Uh, consumers are getting savvier and have 
access to more information to hold companies accountable. How does Coca-Cola balance sustainability with the financial demands in volatile macroeconomic contexts? Thank you. Great, no, thank you. And thank you for sharing your Coke story. I think it's one of the things that I love is hearing about how we've been a part of people's lives and the roles we've played. So thank you for that and thank you for the question. But yes, you are absolutely right. Consumers are definitely increasingly looking for brands and products that are aligned to their values. And sustainability is becoming a huge part of people's value set and therefore their consideration set as to whether which products or brands they do or don't buy. So from our point of view, you know, we talk a lot about ESG, so environment, social governance. And for us, it is vital to a, a business's success. So, and we can also anchor it very much in the purpose of a corporation. And honestly, I feel that no company, whether they're public or private, can achieve their full potential without a sense of purpose. And I know you hear a lot of people throw it all around, like throw that term around a lot, ESG, you know, purpose. But if sustainability isn't integrated into your business, if it isn't a key part of how you go to market day in, day out, then a lot of businesses aren't going to survive or the consumers are going to read between the lines and understand what's actually going on. So we view it as a business imperative. It's not an afterthought. It's not a sideline business. It's a business imperative. But so is profitability. We're not an NGO. We have to make money. Um, and, but it also can't be at any cost. So there is always a huge balance between how do you instill sustainability into the business that's gonna be in a cost-effective way that is the right thing to do for the business. So we link it directly to our purpose. Like our purpose at the Coca-Cola company is to refresh the world and make a difference. And so that make a difference is really important to us. If you think, like even the example you used in terms of your studying and in Lima, and it's a, like we have been so ingrained into communities all around the world that the strength of the local community is, gonna, is inherently linked to the strength of our business. So we've got to like play a role in both. Um, and so I honestly, and it's not just like Joanna personally, this is the company, like we really view our company's future depends on shared opportunities that is going, going to deliver growth. Mm. Thank you very much, um, Joanna. So one of the things that we learned in class is how to quantify ESG, right? And what it will yeah. do, um, show. Um, and you have a question that, that will be one of the examples. But the next one is coming from Roxanne. Hi, Ms. Press. My name is Roxanne Zhang. Uh, first, I would like to start sharing one of my personal story with Coca-Cola. So a few years ago, I visited World of Coca-Cola in Atlanta. And that's when I actually fell in love with the company culture. I think it's amazing how over the years it has like set this tone to bring people together and really um, completed and worked on their mission and their vision. So I guess that's one of the reasons why I chose Coca-Cola this semester and I worked on it this entire semester. I mean, it is very difficult, but yeah. it's also very fascinating. I actually learned a lot. So it, it is a great opportunity to actually speak to someone from the company at the end. So yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um, okay, next on to my question. Uh, I'm a per I'm from China actually, and it, it's been over nine years for me to uh, live and study and work in another country in U.S. And I've noticed that you worked in many many countries yourself as well. So I would like to ask um, across the different continents where you worked, what differences and commonalities did you encounter as a woman in business, and how did you overcome them? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Roxanne, and thank you too for sharing the story. The world of Coke's amazing, so I love going there. Even now. <laughs> um, so to your question, um, so the first thing I'd probably say is that, believe it or not, I actually think there are more similarities than differences. But what I think where the differences come in is in the scale or the range of 
the difference, which I'll, I'll kind of explain as I go through some examples. So I think for like some of the differences that I've accounted as a woman in business is there was a lot of times where I was the only woman in the leadership team or sitting at a table at best I was in the minority like but the minority would have been larger and so that's like one of the variations I see is the number of women sitting at the table differs, differs around the world but we're still certainly not in the majority and rarely do we get to like 50 50 kind of situations I also see in a lot of women and it doesn't matter where we are in the world is a lot often a little bit of reticence a bit of self-doubt a bit of questioning as to did I really earn my spot at the table like why am I here sort of thing um and I think sometimes second guessing themselves a little bit so for me one of the things that I've done is I've gone through to kind of you know overcome some of these these barriers and the different bits and pieces is actually really embracing your strengths. Like I talked earlier about making sure you've got a really good mentor and people around you who can hold a mirror up to yourself. You need to be very clear about what your personal strengths are and where are your development or blind spots. And the blind spots is really important, but you need somebody else to be able to tell you that. And you have to be working on that constantly. But always play to your strengths. Like there's, and whether it's a gender strength, it's the way your brain works, it's your background, it's your culture. We've all got strengths. So don't dismiss those strengths, like use them, but be smart about it. Um, so that's the first thing is like embrace your strengths and don't, don't necessarily play by somebody else's rules. Like that's, you know, there's no hard and fast there and clearly don't try to be, pretend to be someone you're not. Um, the other thing too that I often see is, and this is a cultural difference that I see like men to women, and I often see in sort of, for example, some of the Asian cultures versus some of the Western cultures, is when they look at jobs, for example, and say there are 10 requirements for the job, women, and then, you know, probably more, more sort of some of the Asian cultures will look at a job description and go, well, I only have eight of the 10 skills, I'm not qualified. Whereas others will look at it and go, I've got two of, two of the 10 and I'm going to learn the rest on the job. So there's also a component of just understanding how big different people think and work and knowing that there are times where you're going to have to put yourself into situations where you are really uncomfortable, but that's actually when you're going to learn the most and challenge yourself and put yourself out there. And then there are little things. It's like, you know, when you get that seat at the table, don't sit there and look around the room or look behind you or second guess like, oh, I'm not sure why I'm here. Whatever the reason is, you have that seat at the table. Own your space, own why you're there. And then that's kind of like your strengths and everything else comes to the fore. But don't ever question why are you at a table. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, question <laughs> is okay. coming from Niharika. And it's on behalf of many students. Um, good evening, everyone. I am Neharika and I come from India. Thank you, Ms. Price, for taking out the time and joining um, us here today for this talk. Um, as someone who has been a PR professional and a student for almost three years, Coca-Cola is a brand that always comes in the conversation. Like, there is just so much to learn from this brand. Um, and as someone who is also interning with Coca-Cola this summer, it is truly a great, great opportunity to have you here and ask you this question. So my question for today is a career related one. So it is, should global companies, much like Coca-Cola, hire international students? That's a great <laughs> question. It's a really good question. And what I would say to you is, so we do, you're, you just talked about it, like you've got an internship with us and we do a lot of interns with, with students from all around the world. And I think everyone benefits from it, the internship, but also the company. You've got people that are coming in with fresh ideas, new education, it's a new generation, like there's a lot. And it, it, I view it as a win-win for both sides you know person who's coming in and the company that's participating um 
we're a global company. Like we, we move people around the world. We've hired people. You know, at the end of the day, I still joke about the fact that, you know, running, like even you think about government relations and things like that in the North America, I'm Australian and this is the job that I find myself in. So there's a lot to be said for that international diversity, that different thinking. And we really encourage people to get out of their home countries because it gives you a different perspective. It gives you a different challenge. It makes you just like understand and think about things in a different way and a different nuance. So as, as a company, we're a huge fan of in, international students and just international experiences in general, to be honest. Just lovely. Thank you very much. <laughs> very good news. Leslie, would you like to go next? Hi, Ms. Price. This is Leslie. I'm so happy to have you here and it's a great opportunity to ask you questions. So my question is, um, would Coca-Cola team up with other companies or NGOs about um, environmental communication? And what is the role of internal communication for environmental advocacy? Leslie, thank you. Um, so yes, the short answer is in terms of do we team up with other companies or NGOs for environmental communication? Absolutely. Um, so for example, we've got a partnership. We do a lot of different partnerships in a lot of different spaces with industry, business, government, civil society, to be honest, because we think it's critical to scaling solutions and identifying initiatives and big programs that are actually going to help us deliver our goals that we've got out there. Um, and that extends to communications as well. So, for example, in 2019, we actually, in partnership with the American Beverage Association, with our industry peers, PepsiCo and Keurig Dr. Pepper, and environmental partners, World Wildlife Fund, the Recycling Partnership and Closed Loop Partners, actually launched a campaign that we titled Every Bottle Back. And that actually aims to increase the recovery of and recycling of plastic bottles. So trying to educate people to say like, and actually here, yeah, have a show and tell. So this PET bottle, we actually want it back. This is really good plastic and we can reuse it and re-put it back into our bottles. So since it's founding, Every Bottle Back has also invested $12.5 million in 11, 11 different communities in the US to help more than 300,000 households recycle like I think it's like 690 million plus pounds of PET over a 10 year period. So we're not only doing like communications campaigns, we're also investing in infrastructure in an industry wide NGO competitive kind of situation. And then even like last year, we actually launched Every Bottle Back as an advertising campaign um, that was aimed to increase awareness. Now, importantly, the awareness isn't just for consumers that we want this bottle back and, you know, from a recycling point of view, but it's also to key legislators as they're thinking about legislation so that they're clear that actually this plastic can be recycled and we want recycling back and we need the help to be able to do it. We also partner as part of like a US Plastics Pack initiative and they're um, an organisation that brings together different businesses, not-for-profits, government agencies, research institutes, to all work together to the idea of a circular economy, to getting our plastics back and putting it back into our, our bottles. And then, Leslie, you also talked about like internal communications. So for us, that is critical. And for a raft of different reasons, one is, you know, we want our associates to be proud of what we do and what we're trying to achieve because we all get questions from friends and family when we're out and about, or as part of your job, like if you're out with a customer or you're out with a nonprofit, they'll be asking us questions. So we wanna make sure that with our internal associates, where we are, we're aiming to like inspire them. We wanna foster belief that we're doing the right thing and what this actually looks like. And importantly, we have to be able to equip, equip them so they can be champions of our sustainability work. So, for example, in sustainability, we've held a whole lot of training programs with our employees designed to kind of educate them on what the company's goals are, where are we in delivering those goals, what are the actions that we're taking. 
so that they can actually be our advocates and our champions, but also to feel comfortable and proud about what the company is doing if they're questioned. Thank you very much. The next question is uh, from Arena. Hi, Ms. Price, uh, Ms. Price, I'm Arena Liu. Thank you so much for coming to the class and giving us the chance to ask your question. So here, uh, my question is a little bit longer than others. So like starting in 2019, sparkling water with fruit flavor suddenly became popular in the Chinese beverage market. Take Jinky Forest as an example. Jinky Forest over to Coca-Cola as the most popular brand by consumers in 2022 in China. Jinky attracts consumers through simple advertising slogans, zero sugar, zero calories, and zero fat. I know that Coca-Cola also launched AHA sparkling water in China to compete with other brands in 2020. My question here is that how should Coca-Cola promote its sparkling water brand in the face of the competitive Chinese market? And also, uh, what strategy will Coca-Cola take to continue maintaining its competitive advantage in the Chinese market? Great, very long question, but thank you. <laughs> um, so I, at the very beginning, I actually talked about, we view ourselves as a total beverage company. So, so if you think that in mind, so that also means that we are trying to make sure that we, we are delivering and catering to a diverse range of consumers, which means that we're also constantly adding and evaluating our portfolio of products and brands. So in our China market, for example, we currently have more than 20 brands that are actually available in around 100 different beverage choices. And when we say like 20 brands into beverage choices, that means it could be flavors, different pack sizes, different levels of calories, like all the different kind of options that come under that. So in order to maintain kind of this momentum, we have to, particularly in a market like China, we have to continually reinforce our competitiveness by optimizing the portfolio of products and brands. And we have to also enhance existing leadership of our existing brands. So as you sort of said, it overtook brand Coke, for example, for us. Um, and we also need to be constantly identifying new categories. So we talked about like Coke with coffee, for example, that was a new initiative where we're looking for merging of blurring and merging of categories and things like that so for us in China particularly around you know the different sparkling water sort of brands that are out there it's very geared to the younger generations in the China market um, and so it's really critical through the research and the work we do that we understand their preferences like what is driving their behavior and their choices so in addition to the existing brands we then look to what are the new brands so that's where an aha for example comes into play um, and the, the idea behind AHA was it was tapping into that strong demand for something that's more expressive and overt and a bit more fun by the younger demographic in China. And so we did it through a mix of creative different taste profiles and flavorings mix that we put together, but also, and you mentioned this in your, your question, zero sugars. We, we went with really elaborate packaging. And the moment it's been in market for about a year in China, AHA, and we're seeing really promising results. And we know that it's gonna help bolster us as a really strong player in that zero sugar, zero calorie, zero fat kind of sparkling segment. Um, as I mentioned, we did like some lot of research, deep dive into understanding how do we make the connections with the local consumers? So the packaging for AHA, for example, in China is very different to the packaging in the US, but it's based on kind of consumer feedback. What the consumer is looking for? What are they, when they go down that shopping aisle, what is it that stands out and what are they? So what's the packaging look like? What are the key messages on the, on the packaging? All of those sorts of things have to come in to play. But for example, another one that we've launched in China with our Minute brand, Made brand, which is a really popular brand in China, is sparkling water with juice. And that boasts zero sugar and zero fat. So we know it's a huge growing segment in China and we're playing with our portfolio and brands to see how we can tap into and create a strong presence in that space. Um, but 
while we're doing that, we're also looking to reignite what we call the cork. So that's like your Coke, your Sprites, that sort of thing. So we're reigniting, for example, Coke Zero Sugar and keeping it really fresh and young and vibrant with the younger consumer as another alternative. So, so we're always making sure we've got dual strategies or multiple strategies delivering against the different consumer needs that are out there. And then another one I talked about, Sprite. The Sprite's um, a really big brand for us in China. So we've also launched Sprite Zero Sugar Lemon with mint flavor. And again, that's a unique China kind of proposition that in testing and consumer research, we realized was an opportunity and a flavor combination that they'd be interested in. Hello, do you want to go next? Yeah. Hi, Mr. Price. My name is Jia Lu Yang. Thank you for being here with us. It's a pleasure to talk with you. And my question is how Coca-Cola contributing to sustainability and are there any programs to increase energy efficiency at plants, decrease water usage and create environmentally friendly bottle? And the best, the best practice you have seen around the world? No, great question and very topical. In fact, we actually just launched our ESG, an annual business report. So if anybody's interested, it's on our website. I would encourage you to go and have a look. And there's some great examples in that report of initiatives that we've done around the world. Um, so I think I mentioned this earlier, like sustainability is absolutely at the heart of what we do and it is in our purpose. So refresh the world, make a difference. And that guides a lot of our actions. We've also been really deliberate in our environmental efforts to make sure that we actually have ambitious, measurable goals. So you'll hear a lot of people talking about we need to be environmentally friendly, we need to do X, Y and Z. But the whole idea of like, if, if you don't, if it's not measured, it doesn't get done. So it's really important that we set hard targets and stretch targets. Like there's also no point giving ourselves a little goal and going, oh, I'll pat ourselves on the back, thanks, we did. You know, so we make sure that we, we, we challenge ourselves. So we have key goals in the areas of sustainable packaging, water leadership, climate protection, and sustainable agriculture. And they're like the four main areas that we're really focused on. So in 2018, we launched an initiative which we called World Without Waste, which was an ambitious sustainable packaging initiative that the idea being to create a circular economy where the materials in our pack come back to our pack. And I talked about it earlier in the partnership we've done with the American Beverage Association and our beverage competitors. This is very much in the heart of that space. So this means that we also look at not just how do we get our packaging back and use it over and over again, but how do we ensure our packaging is 100% recyclable? How do we make sure that we're using the least amount of packaging that we can? So what we call lightweighting, for example. And so there are all sorts of things that we're working on. You know, how much plastic do we actually need in that cap for it to be hold the, the product safe, give the consumer the security they need, but then be able to, to deliver using less plastic, for example. In global water, so we set ourselves the target to actually replenish the amount of water we use in the making of our products. And that goal we actually delivered five years ahead of plan. Now, that also gives us a lot of credibility when we talk about recycling our packaging. So, for example, one of our World Without Waste targets is to recycle or to collect the equivalent of every bottle and can we put into the marketplace. That is a really big, bold target. But by able to kind of talk about what we did in water gives us the credibility to say, actually, when we put our minds to it, we can go and achieve these goals and these targets. Um, when it comes to climate, it's kind of threefold. Obviously, packaging is a huge part of our climate emissions and things like that. But we really look to reduce the impact our business is having on climate and then also manage the risks and impact the climate change has on us. So disaster relief strengthening communities, all of those sorts of things. And then obviously partnering to make a greater contribution. So our overall climate target is to reduce our scope one, two and three greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by 2030. And that's also aligned to a climate 
scientific, like the climate scientific targets in the Paris Agreement. So we're also making sure that we're benchmarking with what's happening around the world. And I think the key thing is in terms of best practices we've seen around the world, nobody can do this on their own. So you've got to be able to go out there and partner with others. I think it's also really important that you go and partner with others because they will challenge you to do better, to do more and not kind of rest on your laurels. I also think that one of the, the best things about best practices around the world is the idea that there are other solutions out there. Now, I, there's a quote that I love that I think came from The Economist a long time ago that basically said that, you know, nothing's, nothing is ever new. It's just not kind of evenly distributed. And the idea being that there are ideas of pockets that are solutions out there. We've just got to be smart enough and well enough connected that we can bring them together and then partner with others to scale them to get them over just being somebody's little idea somewhere else in the world. Thank you very much, Joanna. We have you for like three more minutes. Yes. Would that be okay? Three more minutes? Yeah, no, you're okay. good. Super. Yeah. I have no Thanks idea what time it is, George. Oh, Sorry, okay. I was like. <laughs> so, because look, what we typically have done in the past is the students make a very short thank you video and so on. But we felt this is Coca-Cola. We got to do better than that. So I want to show you what the students did. And um, let me go there. So um, last year, uh, one of our students, um, Sue, she has more of an engineering degree. And he said, listen, we have to do the whole NFT from scratch. And so he worked with the cows, sorry, cow shake. And, you know, they did everything. They created a smart contract and uh, tested it on Ethereum and Avalanche, minted the artwork, created the wallet, and then donated all their time so that other people can benefit from it. Now, um, this is the day class and this is the night class. So we all got together and brainstorming ideas and so on. And Joaquin um, here, he's the one who actually did the design and so on. And um, let me show you what it looks like the old way, right? Um, and that way you can see it more clearly and then I'll show you the actual wallet. So this is the work that they did. And uh, you have the photo of all the students here and our very, very um, warm thank you for, for joining our class. And in addition to that, they went ahead and uh, you know did the whole thing and um, put it into the whole wallet, right? So they created a wallet and uh, you will get the details and it looks um, like this inside the wallet. So before I pass it um, back to Michael, you know, this is our sincere way of saying thank you so much for, for joining us. Oh, George, thank you very much. And thank you for all the questions. And I love, I love the poster. That is, that is really special. Thank you. Well, you, you have your own NFT. I think it's already bidding <laughs> up on eBay, you know, where <laughs> no, no sooner was it issued or minted has already doubled in value. So, uh, well, thank you so much, Joanna, George, and all of the class. Uh, it's been a, a really true inspiration for me uh, to listen along and learn and, um, you know, a mixture of a lot of candor and wisdom and practical advice and, and thought. And it's, uh, you know, just tremendous to see senior leaders like you um, as open and, you know, um, and as frank with our students. Uh, it's terribly important, I think, that um, we all sort of see ourselves as more human than we, we sometimes yeah. put each other on pedestals, you know, student professor or student professional. And, and it's wonderful to have more of an open dialogue. So um, I, I want to thank you um, from all of us at the School of Professional Studies here at NYU. Uh, we hope you'll be back. Um, and, uh, and uh, we hope, uh, we want to wish, obviously, the best of luck to our students who are interning with you this summer. Yeah. That's, great. That's great news. And maybe we'll have to get a photo of the two of you on campus or something and can send it back to us all. But uh, I, I've got one quick, uh, one quick piece of housekeeping and one quick, pick, one quick piece of promotion. So, Patrick, um, we will send out after the event a survey. So if... Um, Anybody who registered, in fact, uh, for the conference uh, or the, the webinar, 
We'll get a survey. We'd just love to hear you know, your feedback so we can constantly improve these things. Um, so look out for that in your email. And then quick bit of promo. In this fall, we are launching a new executive master's in marketing and strategic communications. And its goal is really for professionals with more like 10 to 15 years of working experience in marketing or PR who are looking to that path uh, to the C-suite, you know, and how do I become a member of the, um, you know, this, this, the senior group of marketers or PR? How do I leverage marketing and PR, uh, you know, to add value and contribute to the growth agenda of the company, et cetera? So, you know, anyone uh, who's watching or uh, friends of those who are watching, you know, who think uh, might be interested, you know, please do get in touch. It's uh, been designed by CMOs and CCOs, you know, for future and emerging leaders. So um, it should be a powerful program. So. Anyway, George, uh, as ever, one of the curated and beautifully uh, delivered. So uh, we can ask no less. And uh, I, I want to thank all of the students. It's just tremendous to see such a wonderful range of, of, of voices and backgrounds and experiences, you know, and to know that uh, that's all part of the wonderful mix that uh, is NYU. So thank you to everyone. A very distinct pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>